In the days before Christmas, we tried to lift the mood to one worthy of being, in an anthroposophical sense, the appropriate mood for Christmas. We tried to conjure for our souls a Christmas celebration, which in some respects makes this Christmas mood applicable to vital human experience throughout the year. For those seeking knowledge, especially those present, celebrating Christmas in direct contact with spiritual knowledge must be among our most essential attitudes. Celebrating Christmas in the presence of spirit knowledge, what could this mean other than inwardly, fervently, bringing to mind how we carry out our spiritual duty over the year in the context of present human evolution? By understanding humanity's tasks, we increasingly enrich our souls with spirit-derived content, so as to be worthy of being among those who are to carry out the spiritual work essential for the coming epoch. So let us, throughout the year, seek to steep our souls in spiritual scientific content, seek to penetrate anthroposophical wisdom. As the year nears its end, outwardly signifying the waning light of the sun's rays and allowing an excess of gloom to hold sway, we try to understand how to celebrate this festival in connection with other festivals in the anthroposophic year. Let us ever and again be clear that all anthroposophical truth must be saturated, suffused with the mighty impetus we call the Christ impulse. If we try to inscribe anthroposophical truths on our hearts and souls as the message itself of Christ, we may say that at Christmas we need to develop an anthroposophical Christmas mood by allowing what we have gathered in our souls over the rest of the year to be illuminated by deeper soul feelings so that it becomes for us a power enabling us to feel we not only know a little of anthroposophical wisdom but it breaks through into our souls, into our hearts as an all-pervading power of warmth and light. This will enable us in the coming year in all areas of our lives wherever we may find ourselves to fulfill our duties, to bring order to our work If we then try to transform those sacred spiritual truths into hallowed feelings, into a divine force in our souls, then will the earthly forces we initially absorb be born in us at a higher level. That is why at Christmas tide we may ever more vividly call to mind those instances when humanity attempted to advance itself to the spiritual regions where Christ himself is to be found. This is the soul region into which our own German Christian poet Novalis led us this Christmas. Today, too, something of the Christmas mood just mentioned, that feeling of being warmed by beams of warmth, can radiate from a genuinely theosophical poet such as Novalis. If we encounter Novalis in all his gloriously poetical wisdom, we may feel most warmly how from out of spirit knowledge we are given the opportunity to fill our lives with a new lustrous gleam. Outside, life surges on past us and our own work is connected with life's daily bustle. If within anthroposophy we have the opportunity to draw down wisdom from spiritual worlds, we will, however prosaic such opportunities may appear to be, be able to gild our lives with the gold of anthroposophical wisdom. This is something we need to learn. Then we will see that we can fill our lives with a new lustrous gleam once we allow the mood of Christmas to infiltrate our souls, when we allow anthroposophy to be reborn within us as a feeling, as a sensitivity toward Christmas. We will then feel how impossible it is if we wish to remain within the ordinary world, to ascend, however tentatively, to spirituality. Well, there are plenty of reasons that prevent human beings from unfolding wings to reach the spiritual world. What I am about to tell you may be symbolic of this. Many among us might say of spiritual science, 
Well, everything offered by spiritual science is lovely, glorious, would lovingly warm my heart and soul, but I simply cannot believe it. Everything I have learned from the external world, the opinions I have acquired, holds me in its grip and tells me these are just dreams, not built on properly solid foundations. This is how some people are trapped in bitter doubt. Were they able to lift themselves out of the prejudice, opinion, and the pressures of a relentlessly intrusive culture, they would be free to experience the pure ether of spirit. They would see that they are experiencing the power of the spirit, and they would draw this down into the everyday work of their hands. The following small incident typifies the feelings preventing someone in the midst of modern mundane life from feeling in free and unfettered ways what spiritual science offers. Spanning the 18th and 19th centuries, there lived a man, the German aristocrat von Hardenberg. He had a son of whom we can attest, within the limits of our working group, that poetry and wisdom poured from his soul, being as he was the re-embodiment of one of the most significant, mighty and incisive personalities ever to have endowed the earth. Being under the influence exerted by the external world, how would the father of this soul recognize his son? How could he possibly guess at the spirit to emerge from the soul of his son? On the basis of material opinion, he could recognize him just as little as free himself from co-dependency on physical life, and just as little as today's human being can amid material prejudice, experience the purity and compelling power of spiritual wisdom contained in anthroposophy. Old Hardenberg had had to struggle out of raw incomprehension of his son. He had had to hoist himself out of an utterly materialistic life in order, nevertheless, to experience in his Moravian congregation something of its deeply religious spirit, one might almost say toward recognizing a spirit of universal stature, as in days of old. However, he did not succeed in experiencing the power and grandeur of the wisdom issuing from his son's soul. To achieve this, having for so long been enthralled to the rigidly authoritative rules often experienced suggestively within a congregation such as his, he would have had to be fired to the depths of his soul by that truly Christian spirit which can only be understood when it is suffused with the breath of spirit knowledge. Strangely enough, old Hardenberg did once feel that breath of spirit, of Christian spirit, when in the midst of his Moravian congregation a hymn was sung. This song, of whose origins he was ignorant, drifted toward him like a breath of eternity, and he was deeply moved by the hymn, then beginning, quote, What had I been wert thou not? What were I now if thou wert gone? Close quote. He felt something he had never before been able to feel. The celebration came to an end. Old Hardenberg went outside and asked some members of the congregation, Who wrote that glorious poem? Your son wrote it. Liberated from all physical connection, not misled by the prejudices of the physical plane, old Hardenberg felt the compelling power of spiritual life. His son, however, had already been, as regards his physical body, underground for some months. Old Hardenberg only had this experience a few months after Novalis's death. Such was his state that he was briefly swept aloft to spiritual heights, away from all physical prejudice, where he could experience the undeniable might of spiritual realms, something we should feel when untroubled by all bias of materiality. Let us leave all present bias down below. Let us feel the urgency of spiritual life and allow its strength and warmth to flow into our hearts. If we do this at the right time, we will be able to fulfill our duty to present-day humanity. This example, taken from the actual life of Novalis' father, serves to illustrate what I wished to contribute to today's mood. 
to whose heights we want to raise ourselves by means of that insistent force contained in Novalis's songs and poetry. Bracket. At this point, Marie von Sievers, Marie Steiner, performed nine of Novalis's title Spiritual Songs. Close bracket. Steiner again. During this festive time, it is perhaps easiest to feel and to sense, not just to understand and know, what we have been studying over these hours in connection with the Gospels. A good deal of the time we had available over the past year was devoted to these Gospels. So let today's short contemplation, intended as part of our Christmas celebrations, point to some important corollaries to our Gospel studies. The connection with the event that especially at Christmas should appear to us in all its vibrancy, the connection with the phenomenon of Christ. The might and significance of the anthroposophical worldview for the present time and for humanity's evolution can in several respects be measured against the Christ event. If we allow the Christ event to elicit as deep a feeling in our souls as it elicited within the Valis, we will always be challenged anew to ask, how can we, to an ever greater extent, experience the truth of that immense impetus given humankind by the birth of Christ Jesus in Palestine. Within these circles we may bring anthroposophy into a specially inward connection with the occurrence of Christ. We showed how the various streams of human spiritual life in antiquity flowed together into the events of Palestine. We also indicated how the enormity of this event is at best faintly divined by large numbers of people today. Only gradually, in the far future, once humanity has deepened its spiritual life, will this be able to be understood in all its towering magnitude and substance. What wisdom will emerge in the course of earth evolution? The most wonderful deepening of this wisdom will be found in that it itself becomes an instrument for the understanding of what this Christ impetus really is. Today there is in certain respects a pressing urgency to speak of Christ's significance from the standpoint of spiritual knowledge. At the time when Christ walked the earth in human form, humanity received the immensely powerful stimulus to turn once again toward the Spirit. Yet this impetus had the effect an effect persisting into our times, of, as it were, firing only suitable souls with its full import. The rest of humanity, by contrast, as if to exemplify all that needed to be overcome, initially set its course ever deeper into material existence. Human existence is an intensifying descent into matter. Since post-Atlantean times, Humanity has been descending ever more deeply into matter. The Christ event signifies the impulsion to reascend from these depths. This powerful impetus has only been fulfilled to a very small degree. By contrast, the descent into matter in these times since Christ too has become an ever more earthly process such that in this descent thinking, feeling, and human sensibility have also come under attack. We live in and face an era in which materialistic research has encroached on the very idea of the Christ event. In this solemn hour it behooves us to indicate serious matters of our times such as this. Materialistic research has infringed even the greatest spiritual event ever to take place on earth. Just see how materialistic theologians, after the fashion of so-called, in quotes, historical theology, claim that there can be no external proof of the existence of an historical Christ. It is theologians who say, historical research itself is forced to admit that there is no historical proof that any such person existed in Palestine at the beginning of our era. Nobody, of whom the powerful words of the Gospels foretold and still tell, nor of the mighty impetus granted to or discharged into human spiritual life. 
today in quotes science, seems to feel obliged, on the basis of its methods, to expunge the historical Christ from the world. One therefore has to remember that spiritual science is just beginning to be called upon to prove Christ's existence on the basis of its constituent elements. Human belief does not depend on the obscure veracities of a branch of science. Proof upon proof could be brought for the specious, threadbare results of some disciplines. People can live without taking much notice of any such evidence. In future, too, and this will be the case for a long time yet, ever-increasing numbers of people will be inclined toward materialistic thinking. Held in the grip of belief in the, in quotes, reliable research of the historical method that denies the certainty of an historical Christ Jesus. What we hope to gain here, as has been said many times, a new symbol with the golden gleam of wisdom, will appear to be expunged. The time will certainly come when Christ will be known about in circles such as this, circles where there will be openness to spiritual science and through which there will be an understanding of the words, quote, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world, close quote. And where those who are able to see into spiritual worlds will know that he from whom the impulse of Christianity emanates will always be found in the spiritual world and that certainty about Christ's deeds will be gleaned from the spiritual world. Only within circles professing to such an awareness will there be certainty about the symbol under consideration here. Others outside these circles will not acknowledge that the external historical method is itself on shaky ground. Those with chapter and verse on science know from its worn and groundless methods how little is claimed when those qualified say none of the figures from Christ to the Apostles can be historically verified. It will be a long time before people rid themselves of their faith in authority, which they vow is no faith in authority. The worst kind of faith in authority is rife today. People do not realize that the true Redeemer from belief in authority is the individuality who within each human being teaches us to build on the power of our own I, capital. He who has shown us what is to be incorporated into our I can also show us how we find the power of truth, the founts of truth, in our inner being. With Christ within, we find truth within. With Christ within, we find firm ground for free and independent judgment. We find the firm ground extending beyond all authority. But we must allow a grave word at this serious hour, so that we learn to feel our calling as anthroposophists. I would have commented later, comments I feel constrained to make now, in the next lectures were it not some time before we meet again. But I must allude to something an anthroposophist should recognize as a symptom underlying the times, namely what is not possible for the science of our times. Those who want to believe in the science that discusses away the historical Christ will remain unteachable incorrigible. Yet there must be some people who understand on the basis of anthroposophy how all fields of science will dissipate and how spiritual life alone will be the savior of a future humanity. The most important things in current events are not being seen. A court case is taking place in Vienna, watched by the world. The whole of Europe was present in the form of its news representatives, so that news thought to be important could be followed. The crucial thing taking place, however, was probably not noticed by any present. Those not prepared through anthroposophy would, had they heard about it, have considered this vital feature a figment. There was an historian, famous across Europe, considered an expert by his peers, widely published, and a firm adherent of the historical method, that is, a good scientist, this good scientist got hold of some documents from a southern region of Europe, 
purporting to prove treachery in southern Austria, who, better than an historian required to research provenance and sources, to validate such a thing. The whole world relies on documentation. How they are used, compiled, and checked provides truth. That alone is supposed to deliver the truth about the great wonders of Christianity. This particular historian was a pupil of an historian I remember from my youth. There were two such historians, one by method a strictly document-based historical researcher, the other, his colleague, adhered less to those principles, relying more on his student's knowledge of actual historical process. A favorite student of the documentarian presented his doctoral thesis. He was questioned on his knowledge of existing records, upon which documents his contention was based, which physical records supported the veracity of his thesis, for instance, which papal edict contained the first dotted I, essential knowledge. The student knew that this took place under a certain Pope Innocent. The second professor then asked the candidate, the latter's dotted I knowledge being so extensive, which year that Pope had ascended the papal throne? He did not know. When did that Pope die? He did not know. Tell us something about this Pope. He could not. The first professor, whose favorite the candidate was, then said, Mr. Candidate, it is as if you have a board nailed to your forehead today. The second professor, however, said to his colleague, but professor, he is your favorite student. So who nailed that board to his forehead? That historian had not learned anything particular, but he became an efficient archival researcher, establishing with all means at his disposal the verity of times long gone. Was anyone more called upon to examine what treachery had been perpetrated in documents put his way by the most erudite? He went to work with all available means and in a public article accused a swath of people of serious misconduct. A court case followed, during which one of the prime pieces of evidence turned out to be a scandalous fake. It was put forward that a certain person in a certain town had presided over a certain union. A simple inquiry would have established that the person in question was, at the time in question, in Berlin. Here historical research has gone to work strictly on the basis of factual documentation originating in the present and achieving nothing more than being duped by contemporary papers. What I referred to as the most important thing is not that people appeared in court but that the scientific historical method has itself been scrutinized, has itself quite literally been judged. Symbolically, that is the most important totem of a case taking place at present. We need to seriously ask ourselves, how valuable is a method that wades in to pass judgment on whether or not an event took place some nineteen centuries ago, if that method is unfit to track down the most obvious things of the present. The science was itself on trial here. We need to be alert to that. A science proceeding on the basis of materialistic prejudice will always be in the dock where people are too indolent to hold it to account. This is merely an authority of the present moment. It can only be temporary, the sort of authority to be differentiated from that other authority who, which knows who it is. All other authorities are unknown quantities. One never knows who they are, who the science or this m- Madame Science may be. If you investigate what goes by the name of the science today, duly acknowledging a spiritual world outlook, you will see how it crumbles, how it proves to be built on friable, sandy foundations, toppling when genuinely scrutinized. Yet people will not concede to viewing the present from any such perspective. People, excluding those living with anthroposophy, will not be sufficiently conscientious to scrutinize the methods created to force violent materialistic opinions into human souls. For this reason, it will be a long time before there is any possibility, other than in close circles of anthroposophical work, 
of seeing in its true light what will bring humanity the greatest salvation. When what took place in Palestine, which we allow to arise anew in our hearts every year as a symbol, is increasingly denied and expunged by outer science, then there will still be a place within anthroposophical spiritual world streams where the power of the event in Palestine will ray out ever more brightly and from whence will flow out into humanity the life that can issue from this event alone. What can arise and bear fruit in our souls from genuinely witnessing the event in Palestine? Quote, I am with you all the days, even unto the end of world epochs. Close quote. We can say this is Christ Jesus' prime word to us. This means that Christ Jesus walked the earth, embodied in Palestine, at the beginning of the Christian era. Since that time he is to be found in the spiritual world, because ever since he has united with the spiritual atmosphere of the earth. He has become the spirit of the earth. When we seek him, we find him within the spiritual atmosphere of our earth. Ever more and more does he pervade and suffuse all life on our earth. Yet what are human beings to secure through the Christ Spirit ever increasingly inhabiting their souls? If we want to understand clearly how this Christ Spirit comes to rest in human souls in future, then we must attempt what we have been doing for some time in our anthroposophical movement. What we do in the anthroposophical movement does not spring from random caprice, does not originate in some program founded by this or that person. Spiritual life ultimately leads back to the sources we seek in the individualities we call the masters of wisdom and of the harmony of feelings. Here, with them, we find, if we seek assiduously, the impetus and momentum guiding how we are to work from epoch to epoch, from age to age. A great impetus such as this has come from spiritual worlds to humanity in recent times. On this festive Christmas evening and among kindred circles, this important impetus can be referred to as an intimation which has flowed toward us by astral means from spiritual worlds over the last years. Our anthroposophical movement in Central Europe has evolved under the sign of this momentum. In human words, we could characterize this momentum in the following way. Observe what is happening in the outer world. The words of the Gospels are being ever more misunderstood. People quibble about their meaning. They are analyzed with superficial historical methods. All such historical noise has to be silenced for a while by the spiritual researcher. The vital thing is for the Gospels to be understood anew in their literal sense, because in such literal comprehension lies the true foundation of their wisdom. We have been led by the spiritual world to literally come to know the Gospels anew, to understand what is contained in their words. On the basis of this impetus, on the extension and elaboration of this impetus, we proceeded in our studies of St. John's Gospel, those of St. Luke and St. Matthew, and we will also attempt future studies of St. Mark's Gospel. We must try to understand the Gospels literally. So say those whose impetus we receive from spiritual worlds. This is future Christianity. To follow this stimulus to understand the Gospels in their literal sense. What will transpire if we understand the Gospels verbatim, if we follow the guidance of spiritual forces who have now spoken to us more clearly from astral regions than for a century? This will be something which will have to become essential for us if we wish to make ourselves instruments for the right direction and guidance of humanity in the context of what needs to be directed and guided in spatial existence. Looking back into primordial times, at the way in which humanity evolved, we know that the human eye, capital, was not yet fully elaborated. Human evolution leads us back to group souls. Just as animals still possess group souls, certain numbers of human beings possessed a common eye soul. This is found among all peoples. 
so we know that humankind evolved out of a quality of group soulness. At the time when the Christ descended to our earth, humanity had reached a point where ancient group souls had begun to lose their significance. These archaic group souls had withdrawn. Each human being became reliant on themselves for the development of their own soul, their own eye-filled egohood. And who was it who generated what was to pour into each individual human soul? This was caused by the Christ force itself. The more we fill ourselves with this Christ will, the richer will our I identity become, enabling those truths and wisdom to arise in us which we will need to live into the future. Right now in the present we have reached an important turning point. Today some may ask, what significance do we attach to the fact that we speak about reincarnation and yet we cannot remember our previous incarnations. We certainly do not remember them nowadays. I have mentioned this before. If one points to a four-year-old child and says, this is a human being, but he can't do arithmetic, this does not prove that human beings cannot do arithmetic. One just has to wait until that child has matured sufficiently to do arithmetic. Within ten years the child will be quite capable of arithmetic. In like manner will the human soul mature sufficiently to recall previous lives on earth. Whether it can recall them correctly is another question. Now, we are at an important turning point. In the fourth post-Atlantean epoch, Christ descended as the motivating force for humankind to experience their selfhood as a state of being within themselves. We are now in the fifth epoch, the last in which humans will not be able to remember their past incarnations. In the sixth epoch following our present times, people will be able to remember their past lives. Whether they remember correctly will depend on whether their souls have acquired the impetus to do so and whether they have made themselves capable of remembering accurately. Only those will in future prove capable of correctly remembering their present lives who have embraced the Christ impulse, the source of true selfhood. Conversely, for those not embracing the true source of their own I, new group souls will take shape. Look, if you will, at external reality. How people nowadays throng toward loci of group soul qualities without needing to do so, whereas they could find sources of truth that allow life to burgeon in their souls. Observe how many people do things the way, quote, they ought to be done, close quote. They do not seek within their own souls for what can uniquely be found there. But we see them looking around to join others in categories and groups, and how they are happiest not when independently seeking truth, but when they can have what others also have. In fact, they hate individuality, believing that in hating individuality they are forging the strongest weapons against such wisdom as is found in anthroposophy. For anthroposophical wisdom must shine within each human being. It cannot be experimentally fabricated using levers, screws, and such like implements. We do not encounter what is offered on the part of anthroposophy in levers and screws. Each of us must seek within, because we belong to an invisible world into which we must penetrate with our thinking, each individually acquiring wisdom without recourse to external tools. We become an individual through anthroposophical wisdom. If we take this anthroposophical wisdom into our souls in the right individual way, suffused with the Christ impetus, then what will enable us to recall a true I identity in the sixth cultural epoch, something enclosed within itself, something each person has individually, will descend into our souls. Conversely, the memories of those seeking artificial group souls today will be such that they will again encounter group soul qualities. In the sixth epoch, Human beings will remember their present incarnations, but then it will be clear. 
your judgment depended on the judgment of others. And it will be felt as an awful shackle to be confined within such bonds of group soul. Group soul adherence threatens those unable to take up the Christ impetus in our times. If we receive the message of the Christ event, that message of human egohood, then the potential to reach humanity's goals in the sixth epoch descends into our souls, that we do not look back at qualities relating to group souls, but instead at a christened, Christ-filled eye. In this way, the essential element toward becoming fully human in the sixth epoch infiltrates the souls of those who understand how to grasp the spirit of anthroposophy, to cause it to glow and radiate, to stream throughout, which will enable us to become instruments working rightfully and truly in the future. That is the question. Do we decide to look back on our present I am from our future reincarnations in the sixth epoch as non-individual, dependent, and sequestered within group cohesion? Or do we want to recall an I that has embraced the very source of spirituality itself in our earthly evolution, an I that has encompassed the mighty words, quote, before all personality was, before there was anything that could live on earth, close quote, and quote, before Abraham was, was the I am, close quote, bracket, or before Abraham was, I am, close bracket. What lives in us is closely bound with the Father Spirit. What comes alive in us through an understanding of the Christ impulse can only be consciously bound in us with the source of the world if we understand that Christ impetus. The Christ impulse offers us the opportunity, inasmuch as it descends into our souls, to be resurrected in the sixth epoch as one such I identity who can look back over the genesis of their independence. If we allow the rightly understood Christ to be born in our own inner souls, then we will be able to reawaken the memory of this rightly understood Christ from the sixth post-Atlantean age. If we can really celebrate a Christmas festival in this fifth epoch, we will really be able to celebrate Easter in the sixth era. As that lovely song tells us at Christmas, quote, unto us a Savior is born, close quote, so will we, in remembering back to the Christ born in our souls, ourselves hear tidings of this truly lofty I-being. We will recall this, and the memory will be resurrected within us as an Easter festival. Then will we be able to hear the great Easter organ clarion proclaiming, May the Christ in us arise, firing and illuminating our own godly divine individuality. In this way, Christmas and Easter are united in the fifth and sixth epoch of our post-Atlantean times. This is the sense in which we can learn to regard what we experience from the Gospels. We have learned in part, and we will learn more in future, how the Buddha stream, the Zarathustra stream, and the ancient Hebrew stream flowed together into the river of Christianity. How these streams also flowed in the sense in which the Gospels depict into the personality of Christ Jesus. The vitality weaving throughout the pre-Christian world must come to life in our own I, identity, must be reborn, suffused with the Christ impetus then we will be celebrating the anthroposophical festival of Christmas in our own souls, the birth of Christ in us. And if we bring this known and understood Christ with us through Kamaloka and Devakan regions into a new life on earth, and from there ever and again into each new earthly existence, right into the sixth epoch, then will we remember what we experienced in this fifth epoch, then will we celebrate the Christian Easter within ourselves. So may there live symbolically in us, in the form of Christmas, what we have of late taken into our souls and learned from the Gospels to be the Christ mystery, 
let these lights, burning here in our midst, be a challenge to us to live out that imperative, nearing us from spiritual worlds, to understand the Gospels literally. Let these outwardly shining lights be an image of the lights we need to ignite within our souls, which, when lit through anthroposophical knowledge of Christ, will continue burning through the sixth post-Atlantean age. At this Christmas festival, feel, in the sense outlined, that it is within your soul's gift to decide to become a worthy instrument for humanity's evolution into the future. Feel the whole gravity, the whole weight of this anthroposophical resolution. We should not be anthroposophists on our own behalf, but rather in that we take into consideration what has been said here. We should be anthroposophists with a sense of duty toward humanity duty toward all the tasks and missions of humankind. Let the light from the Christmas tree shine as an emblem upon us. Let this light ignite us for this, our spiritual mission for humankind. Then we will have understood something which can give us strength for a new year, for finding our way ever further into anthroposophical life and into anthroposophical wisdom.